Yo, what up, what up, what up, what up? I go by the name of NFT QT or Q Harrison Terry, whichever one you know me by. Today we are on episode 27 of the NFT QT. Show. show 27, my friend. Yeah, this is episode 27. We have our regular, degular guest of the hour, Mr. Cowdery. Degular. Uh, that's regular a new degular. word to me. So, I mean, I, I mean, I feel like you're a regular degular at this point. Like, you know, you're on every, you're pre on pretty much every form of content in the NFT QT universe. You might as well just be a part of the NFT QT. I hope so. You know, I keep you honest. I keep you, you in do. check. That, you do. You keep me consistent, right? You make sure that I show up. So, I mean, for sure. I mean, when you know, I always make sure that before we get going, we talk about the NFT handbook. Sponsor. Yeah. This is the NFT handbook. If you haven't gotten yourself an NFT handbook, well, I'm a little disappointed. You know, I'm the author of the NFT handbook. And, and what's interesting about this book is, you know, twofold. One, it's, it's a book that we wrote to teach you how to buy, create, and sell NFTs. But the thing about it that I enjoy the most is the, the whole concept of, you know, understanding the terminology. When we created this, this book, we, we did it with the, the mindset of, hey, there's people out there that don't know what the heck an NFT is, right? And if they don't know, and they, they don't know where to start, at least there's a book or an audio book or some videos that can help them get going. And so NFT literacy, it's a big deal to me. I appreciate you checking out the book. If you know everything about NFTs, I recommend you go give this to someone that you think should learn about NFTs. So that way they don't have to text you and bug you all day about what an NFT is or, you know, how do you create an NFT or what's a hey, and all that good stuff. Spend the $20 to, to save yourself hours. Exactly. Exactly. So we've, uh, we've, we've seen people in the community, you know, say great things about it. If you, if you're enjoying it or you're just cracking it open feel free to tag me on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, you know, I'll shout you out. Cause I love seeing people start their NFT journeys. So Cowgy, man, we're going to get into an NFT show here soon. And I'm excited because we're going to be talking about Richard Bernstein and his impact and not only the art world, but also now what it looks like the NFT and metaverse space. And for those that are joining and listening to us, we're going to be joined by Rory, who is the president of the Richard Bernstein estate. And in this show, I, I want to definitely talk about, you know, what it means to be a, a, a fine traditional artist and, you know, have people look up to your work, but then, you know, your estate, you're not here. Your estate has to make the, the, the best modifications to your work to turn it into NFTs. And, and really get behind it. Like we're in this world where like post-humanist uh, NFTs are a thing, right? And we're, we're, yeah. we've seen it. This isn't the first. This is the first time we've had someone on the show that can speak to that from a definitive uh, standpoint. But, you know, the thing that really makes this show interesting to me and, and why I'm, I'm most excited to just even have this conversation is we're at this point where we can talk about legacy and the metaverse, right? Mm -hmm. And so... You know, people can own digital objects. That's what, you know, NFTs have largely brought us. So there's this now whole concept of digital ownership. So digital masterpieces, whether it be from a fine artist or someone that you're just uh, meeting for the first time, you can now say, oh, I definitively own this digital uh, masterpiece and it's protected because of the, the blockchain. Now, I'm, I'm stuck because when we think about the metaverse, we don't really think about legacies or, you know, estates or, you know, a lot of the stuff I've seen no. has just been, you know, cool crypto stuff. Yeah. You think of games and you think of like, yeah. how do I keep somebody in here for 10, 20 minutes playing a game that they want to come back to tell people about? You're not really thinking about necessarily an education or like, you know, bringing people who have never heard of you up to speed on, you know, what impact this person had for a decade or two decades or three decades, or maybe who they even influenced, you know, it's, and I think that's where I kind of get stuck is like, I feel for some of these estates because it's like, you want to, to bring on this person, you know, help this le person's legacy that, you know, live on. Right. And you want them to, to still be relevant. And you have this new flashy object called an NFT. And then you have this even flashier object called the metaverse where you can create an immersive experience. And I'm kind of like in that mode where it's, or, or that middle ground where it's, it's like, okay, how do you, you know, to use blatant terms, how do you not fuck it up? Right. You know, like you have this artist who, if they were around right now, they already showed that they had 
big grand ideas when they were alive. And if they were still around, they would have done something like a Damien Hurst, a big idea that 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 kind of like blows people's pants off and is just very, uh, you know, from the mind of an artist who thinks differently. Right. And now you have people who are trying to essentially think like that artist. How do you how do you even do that? <laughs> Well, well, I mean, it's a it's a tough question. The states have had to deal with it for you know quite some time here. The thing that stands out to me though is just the amount of optionality that you have in these metaverse environments. Where you know, I think about Ready Player One, and every time I think about the metaverse, I always think about uh, the scene in Ready Player One. I'm already know what you're gonna say. <laughs> where they go to the library, you know what I'm yep. talking about? The library yep. scene. I, I love that scene because to me, that's what a metaverse is. It's a, it's a big library where people go and they experience things for the first time um, as they happened in a historical context or in a previous uh, timeline. Because what we have now is like this formats uh, shift, right? Like when Richard Bernstein, um, the, the, the artist whom the state will be talking to today, like he made work like 40 years ago, right? And you can't take that work from 40 years ago and then say this is ultra HD 8K. Like, of course, you can upscale and we've seen that done, but mm -hmm. he didn't build with the tools that we have today. So how do you respect that? How do you showcase the, the medium and the formats in a way that is intuitive and, and, and it feels natural? And I think the library and Ready Player One, at least in the movie, it did a great job of saying like, hey, like, you know, this is an older video, but like, this is how the kids are going to look at it. And then like, Here's mm -hmm. like this audio tape or here's this recording or here's this room as it, as it was, because, you know, we have some images and we can, we can recreate that. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to well, need to do that for people that we look like icons. Like I always like, I think we've had this conversation before. I talk about people that have really changed the world. Rest in peace to Virgil, rest in peace to Chadwick Boseman. And, and we've lost a lot of greats this year, unfortunately, but rest in peace to, to all the people that have died. What, is fascinating about that in, in today's society is you can see the impact that you've had on the world in, in, in your real time. I, I mentioned Virgil and Chadwick because, you know, Chadwick Boseman is a great example of what representation looks like. You know, there's a lot of people that now know Black Panther and not only like this is a comic book hero that not a lot of people knew about, um, especially at the at the, the scale that 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 we've now seen it. Right. Like no one would have ever thought. Black Panther was a billion dollar uh, franchise, but you know, Chadwick did an incredible job of bringing that character to life and, you know, and, and, and Marvel and Disney got behind him and, and, and really just did something special, incredible. And it opened up a, a, a whole world of STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics for the people that don't know that um, to, to a generation of kids that are going to go and have an impact on the world. Right. And it's the same reason why, you know, I, even in the background, I've got a Black Panther helmet in there because of the, the significance, right? Like, you know, it, and, and even in my lifetime, it had that impact. I, I mentioned Virgil again because Virgil Abloh represents what it means to literally be a creative, uh, go out, change things, uh, experiment in, in real time and in, in, in create in public. And, and as you build, get better. But like grow a community while doing that. And like, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but like, you know, if you're not familiar with Virgil and you just only know him for off white, you're, you're very severely limited in just the, the, the magnitude of what this guy touched and, and how he influenced just culture at a level that, you know, we probably won't see again for some time. And I mentioned both of these guys because what they had is an impact. Uh, their impact was felt in the material world. And I think anybody in this generation can, can point to something that you can see and be like, oh, wow, this, this has that influence. Digitally, they, they can be felt in, on Instagram and Facebook. And, um, you know, Web 2.0 has done a great job of just kind of saying like, oh, okay, this is in memory of Virgil. This is in that. Yeah. But when and you, you can almost quantify it too. You know, you can actually quantify the impact that they had after they've passed because, oh, how many people wrote a post that said rest in peace Virgil when he died and yeah. you can instantly say oh 10 million people posted this exact same thing there's at least 10 million people that were touched by him 
Yeah, I mean, even even more like yeah, just ten people, 10, 10 million people that talked about it, and, and not yeah. even the people that you can't even uh, can't even track. But yes, like you can do like a Google Trends analysis on it, right? Which is crazy. Mm -hmm. I never even thought about that. But when you go into the metaverse and you start to say like, you know, what about the people that weren't Virgil, right? But that had like a Virgil like impact on society. Mm -hmm. We didn't grow up in that time frame, right? Like I went to a museum once and they did an exhibit. It was all about the sixties. I learned so much about the 1960s just from that, ex that museum exhibit. I learned more about the sixties in that exhibit than I did in the, the actual class that we had to take in social studies. And it was, it was mind blowing to me because I'm like, damn, like, you know, social studies, like they, they kind of failed me a little bit. I didn't know all these things happened simultaneously at this, at this, this really character defining moment for American history, but like the metaverse allows people to actually experience that in a way that is very similar to uh, a museum, right? Because it's fully yep. immersive. You can build, you can recreate, you can um, showcase, you know, clips or images and videos and, and things of that nature. And so when, when you have estates and they go back and they say, okay, how do we keep the, the vision going? How do we, how do we bring the impact? I think being able to tell the story behind the story in a way where you can control the variables and where things go. Legacy in the metaverse is something that there's going to be a, a company, a team, a creative that's going to say, this is how we should think about it. And just like how we have tombstones today to memorize, to memorialize people and, and, and keep them in our, our memories, we're going to have some token of appreciation um, that basically honors your digital existence. And that's going to be carried on in the metaverse. And I think estates are taking the first shots at that today, but we're going to see uh, just all the efforts get compiled and from those compiled efforts, we're going to see some, some, some really true, crazy, impactful things. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it very much could be the evolution of the Wikipedia page, right? You know, because, yeah, yes. you know, everybody who's had some sort of impact on the world has a Wikipedia page, you know, and it's linear, right? You know, you tell the story of them, uh, but it's mostly just through words as a few images here and there, but it doesn't necessarily it doesn't allow you to talk about multiple parallel timelines happening at the same time, you know, and this is something where with the metaverse, you can kind of break the space time continuum. Right. And you can say, you know, Richard created this work at this point in time. And at that same po point in time, this group of people was making this work and this is how they were influenced by each other. And you can kind of almost, cre you know, create, uh, like you said, you can recreate that moment in time, that isn't necessarily bound by just writing a paragraph in a textbook that says this is this is what was happening, right? You can actually sh show a visual of all these different pieces that are happening around the same time that influence this person's work and how they influence then the people right after them. For sure, for sure. I mean, this is uh, we're getting deep. I mean, we've we've been talking about this for a while. Like, I mean, the, the, like uh, the last one of the last episodes we've recorded, we talked about. You know what it means to to leave a legacy, and, and you know what happens to your data and your NFTs when you die. Yeah. Um, what's What's fascinating here is is you know that that is that is a that is a good question. Like we like I think we we should even go deeper and talk about you know I've seen some AI. Uh, we remember Replica AI. Mm hmm. Yeah, where like they created a chatbot from all your text and like you know yeah. written material and like you know it was. It was something so that like if someone passed away, you should be able to like, you know, at least convert with like a um, an AI replica of that of that person. And obviously yeah. it's not the same thing, but, you know, it's crazy where technology is taking us and how you will be able to uh, cope with with just the term that like, you're just going to we're going to we're going to I think what, what's happened here is COVID. Um, forced us all to go down a path and really think about, you know, what does it mean to lose someone? And, and how do you deal with death? And how do you grieve? And the technology around us was a tool. And we're starting to see those tools manifest in new ways to grieve, right? And, you know, it's it, it, it doesn't have to be so lonely, especially now when we've all dealt with, you know, some significant losses. And, you know, when we, I think about the metaverse and, you know, honoring, honoring your loved ones in a way that isn't just a, a tombstone, you know, there's some people that unfortunately, you know, they, they don't want to be buried in a grave, right? It's unfortunate for the, the businesses there, but it's, it's, it's like, 
you should honor the, the loved one or your cherished one, however you feel is best or however they wanted you, you to do that. And how you cope and grieve, you know, you need to do it in a, in a healthy way, ideally. And, and sometimes, you know, everybody can't do it in a healthy way. It's just too much. But the tools that are popping up, they're making it a lot easier, right? One, the technology that is, is just being implemented, the things that we're thinking about, they're tough and, and very uh, paralyzing at times, but they're necessary tools because, you know, it'll be very, very cool to be able to enter someone's world as they left it. Remember in Ready Player One, where they went back to uh, um, the main, the, the, the programmer's uh, his room as mm -hmm. he left it? And it was like an exact replica and they were able to find all the, all the things as they existed. I yeah. think that's going to be more true. It's like, you know, what was Virgil studio? Like, you know, imagine putting on a, a metaverse headset and you're, you're able to see all the things that are there. And I say that because, you know, when, uh, when Virgil passed, I ended up getting this book called abloisms. Um, and it's just like a lot of just things that like all of his thoughts on life, like, you know, just, collected in a book and obviously this was written before he passed but it's one of those things where like we've already done that in the real world right mm -hmm. we just now need to see that being implemented in the uh digital world or the metaverse as we're calling definitely well i think we should probably uh we should get rory from the richard bernstein estate uh into this into the show now um talk to him figure out what what they're planning and chop some ideas up let's do it Rory, Rory. What up, guys? What up, what up? And by the way, I have my NFT QT handbook here, too. Oh, oh you got it. You got it. There we uh, go. Of look, course, look, look of course. Up. That's it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, welcome, man. I mean, for the people that are just joining us and they, they're they not so sure about, you know, Richard Bernstein, could you, could you just do a quick background on who is Richard Bernstein? Sure. So uh, first, thank you guys for having me on. Uh, and uh yeah, so Richard Bernstein, uh, he's probably the artist best known for doing the covers of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine uh, between 1972 to 1989. And he also had a fine art career starting in 1965. Uh, a lot of his works are kind of iconic and well known from there. Uh, but really, his relationship with Andy is probably you know, what he's obviously best known for. And, you know, Andy is just a juggernaut. And, uh, uh yeah so that's that's kind of a little bit about richard in a nutshell so as the president of the richard bernstein estate like what is your typical day-to-day -day look like so uh it's a it's a great question um so i mean i really started richard was my uncle uh, i should say and you know i was always surrounded by his art um and i had a career in finance for 15 years and what i really kind of realized is that you know as an artist, they leave behind this legacy of, you know, this uh, incredible art. And really, it's dependent upon the heirs or somebody else to really perpetuate their art and, you know, to have new people come to the forefront. So, um, you know, I created it for that purpose is to, you know, share his art with, you know, the world and the community and not have his art really die. So, you know, day to day, I'm reaching out to you know, museums and galleries to, you know, do shows. Um, I did a collaboration with Coach a couple of years ago uh, for their spring summer 2020 collection and J-Lo was rocking some of the stuff. So that was really cool. And um, yeah, so I just, you know, I try to get his art out there as much as possible, whether through brands or galleries or, or museums. Definitely. That's super cool. Um, and you, you are you know, the president of the Richard Bernstein estate, you see all the craze that happens with NFTs last year, you're starting to pay attention to it. At what point did you start to say, Hey, this NFT thing is something I should take serious. So, I mean, for me, and I think a lot of people in the fine art world kind of, you know, took a step back when they saw what people did at auction and we were like, Whoa, this is for real. And I think, that was just an explosion for so many people and especially in like the fine art world where they just had to take notice you know i think before they were like oh this is like a jpeg this is a joke but then when something sells for 69 million dollars they're like hey wait a minute so i mean that was kind of me and i mean to be perfectly honest with you too you know richard 
you know, was so pioneering in, you know, the work that he did. And Andy was too, right? So, you know, Andy, you know, with the silk screens, and then even in your handbook, you guys talk about how Andy and the Amiga computer was like one of the first. But in truth, and maybe there's going to be a revision to this handbook, I hope, is that Richard is actually the first pop artist to really create digital artwork. Hmm. There was a computer in 1981 that came out called the, um, the Quantel Paintbox. And there's actually a really cool documentary that people could watch on YouTube with David Hockney using it. And in 1983, Richard created a portrait of David Bowie, which was actually the first pop art uh, work on, done on a computer. And uh, I didn't know that. Ryan, did you know that? Uh, I, I, I read it when I was kind of researching Richard, I was like, uh, I, I, one, I was fascinated. And then two, there was a little bit of drama around it too, where wasn't it, they wanted to use it for a cover, but then David was like, no, don't use it. Wasn't there some drama around it? There was. Yeah. So, you know, Richard and, and Bowie, they were friends for a while. Bowie actually went to a couple of Richard's art openings in the mid seventies and Bowie talks about it in his diaries. And that was always somebody that Richard wanted to do a portrait of, but for whatever reason, Andy would always kind of blow him off and say, you know, hey, I'm not going to put you on the cover of interview, which is kind of strange because Andy's sort of famous for always telling everybody that they would be on the cover of interview magazine, but it was really up to like the people that ran interview, like Bob Colicello and Vincent Fremont, who would say, you can't be on, but somebody else can. So, you know, Richard was advocating for Bowie and it just never happened. So Richard was like, you know what? I'm going to just create my own portrait of Bowie. And it was featured in Richard's book that he made in 1984 called Megastars. And, um, and yeah, that's kind of how the Bowie came about. And that was, uh, you know, Andy died in 87. So he never got to be on the cover of, of interview. Man. Um, so talk to us. I I, I want to get into like a lot of the the futuristic stuff after we talk a little bit about what you guys are up to. So could you kind of describe, you know, you're getting into the NFT space, describe this NFT drop that you guys are doing. Sure. So, you know, we're doing uh, three different images. Uh, we're doing uh, the Grace Jones, uh, which is actually the edition of 50. And, oh, okay. Uh, All right. Got that wrong. Oh, no problem. All good. Um, so that was done for the cover of 1984 uh, for Interview Magazine. And really, Richard was best friends with Grace Jones. He was the godfather of Grace's child, Paolo. And, you know, as you can see, Grace is behind me, too. I, you know, she was I, she was around my life, too, growing up. She was, she was a fantastic person. And, uh, you know, really, Richard was instrumental in her career, and he you know, dressed her and created all these like wonderful portraits. And this is actually my favorite portrait that Richard did of Grace because, you know, it really kind of shows her, you know, her fierceness, but also her vulnerability. Um, and I think that's really only something that Richard really could have captured because he knew her so intimately well. And then the other drop we're doing is the Andy Warhol wallpaper, which is the addition of 10 and so we're doing that in 10 different colorways. Um, and that's because Richard, when he was creating this, had 10 different colors that he was going to use uh, before he did this final one here. So we're introducing that as like kind of like behind the scenes in the archives, like, you know, what his process was. And then the one of one edition, we're doing the Andy Warhol with red paint. And that's what Richard made on the Quantel computer uh, in 1990. And it debuted in 1992 at a gallery in Beverly Hills, curated by Joan Quinn, who a lot of people in the fine art world know who she is. She's a prolific collector, and she actually uh, sold an Ed Ruscha, uh Hurting the World Radio number two a couple of years ago for, I think it was like 50 or $60 million, something ridiculous like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's those are the drops. Interesting. Um... I'm I'm very curious, like, you're the president. Um, we've seen a couple other, you know, estates kind of get into the NFT space, some good, not some not so good. What were some of those hurdles like, you know, to, to essentially take this, uh, you know, this work and create a posthumous NFT? Yeah, so, I mean, for me, it just, it, it made a lot of sense, right? Considering that he was 
you know, working with digital artwork, you know, before he passed. And that was, you know, in the later part of his career in the 90s, and he passed in 2002. So from like 1990 until he passed, he was working on computers. So for me, it was like a natural, easy progression to, you know, kind of introduce his work to this whole new audience of NFTs. Um, you know, I think some other artists maybe have a hurdle of, you know, yeah, estates rather having that hurdle because maybe their artwork didn't do that. And they're just putting up a JPEG of, you know, what the artist created. And they're like, well, now this is a NFT. You know, this, I think is a little bit different because it's actually, you know, done with a computer and, you know, he had that forethought and that pioneering aspect to his career. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, what comes to mind when I was thinking about it was, uh, there was uh, a Basquiat drawing that this was way back, I think April, 2021 that dropped on OpenSea, And, um, you know, the whole catch of it was whoever won the auction was going to get to burn the, you know, had the choice to burn the original or the NFT. And, you know, they had a pretty high price tag. It was like 50 ETH or something. It sat there for about a week. And then the, the estate kind of comes back around like, no, we actually don't want to do this. You never had our permission to do it. And it kind of just created this drama where it was like, okay, did anybody actually have the permission or was this something where it was like, let's test the waters. And then all of a sudden it didn't go as they planned and they kind of redacted it. And so I'm, I'm just very curious, you know, what are those kind of ty those types of hurdles when you're talking about, you know, an artist's estate, you know, now transitioning to this new form of IP uh, generation, like what was that process like? Were there other people you had to convince of this? Well, so the estate is comprised of uh, my mother, who is Richard's sister, and my brother, who, um, you know, he's in finance and he kind of defers everything to me as far as that. And my mother, too. So, I mean, really, like, I'm, you know, the sole decision maker of the estate, but I, you know, consult them. And, you know, they thought that this was you know, a, a great idea to introduce to just a new community of people who may not know of Richard's work, who, you know, I, again, you know, like Richard, you know, was really, like I said, that pioneering artist who created, you know, the first digital artwork in the pop art world, and nobody really knows about it. So, you know, for me to be able to voice that and to get that across and, you know, to educate people is, you know, uh, an awesome thing. I think with Basquiat, I do think that, you know, I think it's run by his sisters, I believe. And they were probably testing the water, right? I mean, Basquiat, he's obviously a huge name and incredible artist, um, but it doesn't translate to an NFT because he wasn't working with computers, right? So I think, you know, maybe they were just kind of testing that out and seeing, you know, a different revenue and avenue. And, you know, I've had some other artists' estates that are doing NFTs and that are also, you know, trying to get into it. But it may not make as much sense in a way, you know, that, that I think mine does, but, you know, I think some people and some living artists are doing a tremendous job. You know, David Sally, I think is doing a, a great job getting into the NFTs and, you know, Damien Hurst obviously had his drop with the currency and, you know, some other things. And I, I think they're transitioning quite well. I think for an artist's estate, it's a little bit more difficult. And I think those hurdles are, are certainly there for a lot of them. So, I mean, how do you think about like activating the community, right? When you have, you know, an NFT an artist, you know, someone that really can't speak for it, you have to speak on their behalf to at least influentially, or, like to at least influence and build a community. Where, where, where's your head at there? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, for me, because we have a lot of things going on with the estate, I think, you know, to build a community, like, every token holder of these NFTs, they're gonna have the VIP access to a print exhibition that we're having in May. Um, and so we're gonna be also giving out some like rare books and some things from the archives to kind of like build up the, you know, the base as well. Um, and we're gonna be dropping, you know, some things later on in the future for them as well. And just, you know, it, for me, it's really about, you know, spreading Richard's art and his message and, um, yeah, just trying to get out there as much as I can for it. So do you see like the opportunity here being able to like build a legacy in the metaverse per se? Yeah, no, I mean, a hundred percent. So, you know, one thing that I want to do um, is, you know, really kind of create this 
community where it's like going into Studio 54 or the back room of Max's Kansas City and having that kind of a feel of, you know, having those people who lived during that time, but also have like new people come up and like perform music and, you know, just create this whole universe that, you know, so that's, that's the future plans for, for us here. No, I mean, that, that's, that's a very ambitious and like, you know, it's a huge opportunity, right? Like someone's going to land it, but the people that are going to land it and, and figure it out, they're starting right now. So it's exciting to see this. Like what was the most helpful resource for you to really wrap your head around NFTs? So, I mean, not just because I'm on your, your podcast here, but I mean, quite honestly, your handbook was tremendously helpful and, you know, really just talking to other people too, and, you know, seeing what, you know, projects they're doing and just, you know, I'm on Twitter now for the last month. I'm very new to Twitter, but just like hanging out in Twitter spaces and, you know, reading people's threads, it's been like really educational and, and eye opening, and, you know, people are doing some really cool things out there really interesting so when um, when you when you look at like just twitter because i mean it's its own culture right like nft twitter is uh is something that you know you either love it or you hate it right and you're right. You're, you're 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 dropping in there you're seeing it fresh set of eyes you know what what community stands out to you because there's different like there's there's p there's a lot of pfps there's a lot of yeah. people that believe in like layer two solutions there's a lot of uh, tokens that are even, you know, very popularized in that, in that space. Like what, like what, what jumps at you? What's calling you right now? Because I think that that's also going to have some influence on, you know, the project ideally. Right. Yeah, no, certainly. So, I mean, I think, you know, for me, I've been hanging out a lot in the NFT photography spaces. Um, and I feel like that's very interesting and that's probably the most parallel to, you know, Richard and, and his work too, because you know, these interview magazine covers and, you know, this Grace Jones behind me, they started off with a photograph either by Richard or by a famous photographer. And then they would give it to Richard and he would airbrush it and paint it. Right. So I think what people are doing with, you know, photography and photographs, is really interesting. So I've been hanging out a lot in those uh, spaces and, you know, a, a lot of people have a lot of interesting stories to share. Um, some are inspiring, some are very tragic. Um, but it's been, you know, really cool to see. And I think, you know, it really made this whole art world really like, you know, accessible to a lot of people and egalitarian. And I think it's an amazing, beautiful thing to see and watch and, um, super excited about it. Well, you know, we're going to get involved with the NFT drop. I'll try to see if I can get one. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll put it up in my metaverse that's coming soon. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, I mean, beyond that, you know, we're excited. And, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where we'll, we'll be watching from our end. And we will definitely catch you at the drop. And, and, and thank you for taking the time. I think what's fascinating here is whenever we get a chance to see um, the traditional art world get influenced and, and get connected with the, the NFT tech world, I do think that there's opportunity there, right? Like there is an opportunity to say, hey, they don't get it, they're old, they're washed. And I think that if you do that, you have a very uh, nascent understanding of what art is and in the community that art has has continued to uh, manifest for generations, right? Like even with the estate, you're, you're upholding, you know, uh, Richard's legacy and you're, you're what, the third generation? Uh, second. Second, so my bad. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're the second, you're on the second generation. That's right. incredible, right? Like we we don't even really see that in tech, right? Like so, you know, there's a lot that tech can learn from the art side, and where we're at with it, I just think that you know some of the the value that has been exchanged in like the the, the pure like NFT crypto side of things is definitely absurd, right? Like I think that there's some crazy crazy high prices, but I I do think that you know the art market is not far behind, right? Like when art really figures out NFTs and when blue chip NFTs are an established thing that people can know and understand and talk to and relate to, uh, we're going to start to see the prices, I think, also catch up from the art side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to touch on one last thing, too, with, the, you know, we 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 talk about building a legacy in the metaverse. You know, it's kind of like almost a second chance, right, to, to have your art hit a different audience, um, potentially hit a blue chip status of some sort and really create a new cool factor, right? You know, 
pop art kind of had its time. We, in, we, we were influenced by it and then we kind of transitioned out of it. Right. And now you're saying, Hey, you know, here was this, this guy who was my uncle. He did a lot of really cool things. You know, the average person doesn't know who he is. The art world probably knows who he is, but how can we kind of bring it, you know, and I, and I, and I look at a guy, um, you know, or, or what, what you're doing, like with the NFT or the wallpaper, like, I think that that fits very interestingly to the metaverse, right? You know, you think about all these different galleries that are popping up and people designing their own spaces. It's like, okay, can, can every single small bit and piece within that, you know, little metaverse environment be an NFT from the wallpaper to the floorboards to the, you know, whatever, you know, the lampshades, I don't know, like, all these little small idiosyncrasies in an environment could essentially be, you know, influenced by some somebody else's artwork that now is, you know, turned into a desk, kind of like how Supreme does it. You know, Supreme just mm. takes all of these random objects, slaps their brand on it, and now it's the coolest thing. Like, I'm going to go and buy a, a Supreme screwdriver. I could very much see the same thing for, uh, you know, pop art, which was consumer goods, you know, essentially like flipped in this new art aesthetic, I guess, uh, I mean, was that, what do you think about that? Or Q, I mean, any ideas there? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, I could tell you like Richard, you know, he, he probably would have loved this whole NFT, right. And creating like, you know, what we're doing with the wallpaper. So, I mean, Richard created sculptures because he loved, you know, the 3D aspect of it. Um, I don't know if you guys can see the pills behind me. Um, he did that with Paloma Picasso in the mid-1960s, and he had these, like, big pill sculptures. And, you know, he wrote in his journals how he, you know, was really fascinated by the 3D aspect of it. And, you know, so I think, you know, creating a universe and creating these things that move and, you know, creating, like, this fine art world and bridging that gap into this NFT and the metaverse you know, he would have been all about it. And I think it's really fascinating, um, you know, to be a part of and to kind of carry that torch for him. Well, especially too, with like, when you think about, I, I like this as kind of a, a different, a difference, right. You know, where Richard is in this interesting space where he's, he's known by the people who should know him. He's not known by the people who don't know, who, who, who should probably know who he is. Um, mm -hmm. And now you get the second chance to essentially like, kind of, you know, uh, and I'm just going to go off on a tangent here. I don't know if this is in your plans or anything, but you could essentially create, you know, the museum of Richard Bernstein and, or, you know, the, the metaverse space of Richard Bernstein and really create, you know, the upgraded version of a Wikipedia page where it's now like, Hey, check out this, this, this VR space that I built around my uncle who did all this awesome, great stuff. I don't want you to just go and watch a couple of YouTube videos or go on a Wikipedia page. I'm going to curate this space. I'm going to teach you about it. And that has like a lot of, uh, you know, interesting pathways for, you know, education, um, you know, bringing up the youth on, you know, something that happened throughout history that, you know, isn't, shouldn't just be consumed in a te textbook, but should be consumed in, in almost like real life. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Idea. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think you hit it on the head. And, um, you know, when, when the whole NFT thing came about on, on my radar, you know, I really thought about that. And really, you know, this is my opportunity to really like build Richard's legacy, like beyond what the traditional art world knows of him. And you're absolutely right. Like I can create a whole metaverse of, you know, the Museum of Richard Bernstein and a Museum of Pop Art. And, you know, he was instrumental for Andy and, you know, all these celebrities. And, you know, I think uh, this provides me with the opportunity to really do it. So it's really, it's awesome. Well, we're excited for the drop. You know, we're going to catch you in the future on that one. And, you know, thank you for making the time. This has been a great show. Yeah, thanks, guys. I, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, thank you for all that you guys do and educating people and, you know, getting people up to speed. And uh, it's awesome, man. So thank you again.